What we've seen in the last few days is a small number of MPs seeking, seeking, seeking to undermine the democratic decisions of the Labour Party members and the Labour and Trade Union movement. Let me, let me make it absolutely clear. Jeremy Corbyn is not resigning, he's staying on. If 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 there are members of parliament or members of the party who disagree with Jeremy and his policies upon which he was elected, it is open it is open to them under our constitution to seek another election. But let me make it clear, if there is another leadership election, Jeremy Corbyn will be standing again and I will be supporting him. And the reason for that, the reason for that, is that this is not about any individual. This is about democracy of the movement. Jeremy has appointed a new shadow cabinet. It, it will meet tomorrow for the first time as an administration to oppose the Tories' austerity program they're seeking to implement on our country. Now, a number of MPs have complained that people are turning up in demonstrations to express their view. Some have described it as rabbles or mob rule or whatever. Let me, let me make it clear, let me make it clear, and we're all, we're all of the same mind. People have the right to peaceful protest. It will be... <laughs> it will be... <laughs> it will be... <laughs> It will be... It, it will be... The protests... The protests will be peaceful, but the reason the, peace, the protests are taking place is because we will not... The democracy of our movement to be subverted by a handful of MPs who refuse to accept Jeremy's mandate. In these coming weeks, in these coming weeks, we want you to stand firm in solidarity with Jeremy Corbyn from all that he represents. But let me say this to you. We're not going anywhere. We're st We're standing solid in solidarity together to ensure to maintain the democracy of our movement and to ensure that Jeremy Corbyn remains as leader of the Labour Party. Solidarity. Hold the button and keep it close to you. Not that. Both.
anyway. Anyway, I didn't know about this until five minutes ago. And now I see the greatest crowd since the miners won in 1974. Dodgy Dave has just left the Commons. The saddest thing in the last few days has been the fact that I'll not be able to call him Dodgy Dave after three four months. I'll not be able to tell him that people that live in pigsties should throw stones. We've got a battle on to save Jeremy as leader of the Labour Party and we're going to win. So by the time that we get to October, Dodgy Dave will have gone and Jeremy Corbyn will be back. And now he's here, Jeremy Corbyn. What a wonderful tribute. I'm going to hand it over to Jeremy, our leader today, our leader tomorrow, and our leader to fight the next election. Thank you very much. Can I just, friends please, straight after we won the leadership election last year, we came to this very same spot to speak up for the rights of refugees to live in our society. And one of the horrible disfigurements of our society is racism, is intolerance and the violence that's often associated with it and sadly this has increased over the last few days. Can we all agree we are going to unite together as one people, one society and one community to oppose racism in any form? And that, and recognise that the grotesque exploitation of workers in zero hours, on zero hours contracts in factories around Britain, called out by Dennis Skinner quite brilliantly in the House of Commons a couple of weeks ago, shows that we don't need the blame culture, we need the unite culture of working together for the social justice to which we all aspire. We have a government that is destroying council housing and public sector housing within our society, that is failing and refusing to regulate the private rented sector, that is allowing children to be brought up in insecure, overcrowded, damp, expensive accommodation. We have a government that is giving tax breaks and tax relief to the super rich within our society. We have a government that is systematically privatising at least half of our national health service. And if you overlay the map of poverty in Britain, one of those heat maps, bright red where it's the poorest, and you then overlaid it with blue dots of where the biggest cuts are taking place, they would be exactly the same, because that is the priority of this government. 
And so when we contested the Labour leadership last year, it was fundamentally on an economic question. John McDonnell, as our Shadow Chancellor, has called this out and turned our party into an anti-austerity and turned our party into an anti-austerity party. And I thank John for all the work that he's done. And I thank Diane for all the work she did at the Department of International Development. And I'm delighted that she is now the Shadow Secretary of State for Health. Because all these issues have to be linked together, fundamentally, to economic inequalities within our society. Our movement, our labour movement, was founded on the most immense struggle. Those that laid down their lives in the 18th and 19th century. Those that were gunned down campaigning for the right to vote. Those that were gunned down trying to become trade unionists. Not just here, but all around the world. It's the spirit of hope or the spirit of despair. Which are we? We're obviously hope, not despair. So that hope recognises that those that struggle against racism, those that struggle for rights to be lesbian, to be gay, be whatever you want to be, those who struggle to achieve those things, those who struggle to gain the right for women to vote. All of those things were gained by struggle. And I would want nothing more than our history teaching in schools to so improve that our children understand the rights they have, the rights they enjoy, came from those that laid down their lives before. But it's also about the kind of society and kind of world we want to live in. I've mentioned refugees, I've mentioned economic injustice, I've mentioned the services that we have. But we also have to think about our natural world and our environment. Either, either we live in the natural world and ex accept we have to sustain it by defending it, or we grotesquely exploit it. You, this is why I was so pleased when John, on the first budget statement that he did, asked for and did an environmental audit of the effect of that budget. So I want to see a government in Britain that does house people, that does protect and defend our environment, that does protect and extend our health service, but also reaches out with attitudes in society. We have, we have, a, we have a mental health crisis within our society, and Diane is very well aware of the importance of how we deal with that. So if I may say so, it's also a question of our own attitudes towards those that are going through stress or crisis, how we change that and recognize that we suffer stress through economic injustice, through inequality, through work, through debt, a whole lot of things. But we have to also think of how we behave ourselves. And so I just ask you this very carefully and very specifically. When we disagree with each other, as we sometimes do, when we disagree with other people, as we sometimes do, if we hurl abuse at each other, I hurl abuse at you, you hurl abuse at me, I hurl it back, the first two or three times it's quite funny, or can be, the fourth or fifth time you've totally lost the audience who may have been listening to you in the first place. So, we pursue the politics of justice, of equality, of human rights, of peace around the world, but we also pursue the politics of respect of how we treat each other. And so, that way we build greater unity. That way we build a unity of people. I do not want to live in a country where there are people sleeping on the streets while the mansions are kept empty. I do not want us to walk away 
from any international conventions on human rights and replace them with something else. Because to me, human rights are universal, not national. And so the political atmosphere we have is about challenging those orthodoxies. But it's also about challenging an economic orthodoxy that has been on the rampant march for 30 years or more. When Reaganomics took over in the United States, when Thatcher took over in Britain and destroyed the manufacturing industry and so much of the economic base of our society. The whole agenda was the redistribution of wealth away from the majority to a very small, very wealthy majority, otherwise known as rolling back of the state and rolling back of the role of the community in the provision of services. I don't want to be somebody that says to young people, sorry, you're not going to have it as good as we did because the nation can't afford it. And sorry, your children, our grandchildren, are not going to have it as good as you are because the nation can't afford it. And we then cascade inequality and poverty and debt down the generations. Or are we to say that the brilliance of technology, the brilliance of science, the brilliance of engineering can, should and must be the tool and the opportunity for the redistribution of wealth, for the opportunities of equality. And that we develop an economy that excites people and mobilizes a whole generation that have been told they only have to look forward to a lifetime of debt in the future. That's why the movement we now have in Britain, the movement for social justice and the movement for equality is so strong, why it reaches out so broadly. Because we learn from each other, because we learn from the values of each other, because we learn from the history of each other, because we learn from the tolerance of each other, for whatever grouping, ethnicity, faith we happen to be. That is where unity comes in, and that is what makes us strong. Don't let the media divide us. Don't let those people who wish us ill divide us. Stay together, strong and united for the kind of world we want to live in. Thank you very much.